guess this is all caught on camera, so I can also say this. Um, while planning my speech, I said, Akshita, don't cry, don't trip, and don't read from your notes. I can't promise you I'll do either of those things. But I can promise you I'll be unabashedly myself. So what I was going to do was walk on stage, very poised, and ask you a question. So I want everyone in the audience to close their eyes and go back to the earliest memory they have of their favorite space. I want you to actually remember its touch, feel, smell, maybe taste. Now open your eyes and hold on to that thought. I'll be coming back to it. My talk today is going to be one of rediscovery and exploration. It's going to leave you with one question to ponder. How do the spaces and how do the stories that we tell ourselves matter? You see, in rediscovering and exploring my ancestral home and my roots, I was able to rediscover myself. My name is Akshita M. Bhanjdeo, and I was born between Bengal and Orissa. I went to an international boarding school in Singapore when I was 14 years old, and later as a Davies scholar to upstate New York to finish my college. I went to study dance and drama and came out with a, albeit, similar theatrical pursuit, that of studying political studies. I worked for a decade in the social impact space, mostly in communication, because I believe there's only one way that I could really change the world, and that is by storytelling. You see, I genuinely believe that great ideas, they do shape the world. But our forming of these great ideas come from the stories we surround them with. So something about me as we're talking about identities. You see, when I went to school in India, I was um, afflicted by a really serious disease. Now, this disease taught me three things. One, of being resourceful, or how in India we'd like to say jagaru. Second, of having great resilience. And third, of empathy. Because I know what it's like to be in a room where you feel like no one believes in you. Now, this serious disease that I'm talking about is found in schools, Indian schools mostly, and it's that of being a backbencher. I can, I can see all the people in the back. Um, so this backbencher identity really influenced me. And to be honest, I didn't even want this to be part of my speech. It kind of embarrassed me. And as my best friend over a very 4 AM call who told me that you need to put this in because this mattered to you. It shaped who you became. Because it wasn't really about my marks or lack thereof. It was about the fact that people in positions of power had ingrained in me a sense of shame and humiliation, of making me feel that I wasn't actually adequate. I may not be worth it. And it took me many years of unlearning that my sense of perfectionism, my sense of being in control of all situations, and my, for, my formulation of an idea of success came from wanting to shrug off this mentality. I was worth it. I did deserve everything. But you see, the, the reason why this is important is because it took me also many years of unlearning to realize that I always believed the grass was green on just the other side. And that it took me many years to also learn that the grass is greener wherever you water it the most. Because when we attach ourselves to certain stories and ideas, they actually manifest into our identity, into actions we then take. So Charles Holton Cooley has this quote, I am not who I think I am. I am not who you think I am. I am who I think you think I am. The reason why I like this quote is because it reminds us that when we associate ourselves with certain identities and stories, they actually get ingrained in our DNA. They actually, became, they actually manifest into actions we take. So the etymology of my last name, Bhanj Deo, the word Bhanja means to break. You see, I come from a long line of men and women who broke in convention for what they believe was the greater good. And after 25 years of being part and you know, achieving my idea of success, living in global cities, working from one eminent institution to another, I still felt a sense of restlessness and discontentment. And I couldn't quite place why. And so I decided to take that manifested quality my ancestors had passed down in me 
and break my convention and shatter my stereotype. And so I decided to leave a major global city. I decided to leave an eminent job and actually move back to what my family's primary residence was, a small, quaint, sleepy town that I love called Baripada in Mayurbhanj, which is in the eastern state of Orissa. What does Mayurbhanj have to do with my identity and how does where I come from really inform me? So you see, in um, 598 AD, one of my ancestors decided to come to Kiching and call it home. And through wars and invasions and disasters and famine and the rise and fall of dynasties, here I am, the 48th generation of the Bhanja family. Now, I, I swear to you I didn't achieve that. That just literally happened. But I'll take the applause. Um, that's my sister looking out into once we discover waterfalls. So once my, once I had sort of, you know, had this idea of success, this idea of being a powerful person, independent, strong, achieving things out in the city, um, it was, I, I thought there was a textbook formula for success. And these ingredients of success didn't really match up. I couldn't really find them in a place like Baripada, Mayurbhanj, and Orissa. So I realized that I needed to rediscover parts of that region. Now, why was my family, this is their primary residence, and why were they sort of all coming back and all coming back here? It was because they decided that they wanted to open up our ancestral home, the Belgaria Palace, to actually be become a heritage boutique property and invite people from all over the world to come here. So let me come back and ask you, what is the earliest memory you have of your favorite space? I'm just going to randomly ask the audience. This is not random at all. Um, could I ask you, please? Could I ask you why? Amazing. So the reason why I asked that question, and no matter what your answer was, it's because you probably have a positive memory associated with it. You probably are, you have, you know, your fond memories of your family or friends or people you love as part of that memory. You see, what stories kind of do to us is they don't just inform our future, but they actually become coded into our past memories as well. They inform your very present. Um, when my family told me that they were moving back to Vaifada Mayurbhanj, uh, I was skeptical. Like I said, it wasn't part of my idea of what I thought, you know, where I could achieve something great. There seemed to be such a large legacy there. It was shoes too big to fill, a legacy too heavy to carry. And I said, what more could I add? What story could I tell that hasn't been told? What greatness can I achieve that a king hadn't already planned or thought or done? The story of my state, my region, my home, my family had already been told. What could I possibly add? And so I decided that if I really need to find myself in this place, through the process of restoration, maybe I rediscover this region. So I started a little bit of a search. That's me and my sister actually walking to a 14th century ruin in Mayurbhanj, which was decimated by Feroz Shah Tughlaq. It's called Haripurgar. Haripur is actually infamous in Akbar's biography, the Akbar Nama. That's us literally rediscovering this place. So when I started rediscovering the history of Mayurbhanj, the history of the region, of my family, it was beyond my wildest imagination. It was nothing that I could really have fathomed before. You see, the Belgaria Palace had been built, and the commissioning of the building had been done by Maharani Sumitra Devi. So for those of you unfamiliar, before the Indian advent of democracy, South Asia was actually a conglomeration of different princely states, 575. And Mayurbhanj formed part of the Eastern States Agency, one of the largest in the East. Maharani Sumitra Devi, and Mayurbhanj was ruled by both men and women. She, come, she got a quite a formidable figure. So, she ruled from 1796 to 1810, and 1804, she decided to commission these properties across Mayurbhanj. You see, what she was doing was a rebranding exercise, because she had been fighting wars. She had been fighting the Marathas, the Nawabs of Bengal, and the British. And she decided that if we need to show ourselves and be on the same table as global powers and have diplomatic communication with them, we need to be able to be part of that global conversation in a certain way. Our story needed to be different. And so from the ravages of war, she brought Mayurbhanj to a new age of industrialization. 
and the Belgarai Palace was supposed to house foreign dignitaries and diplomats from all across the world to come to Mayurbhanj, invest in its people, their ideas, their talent, their entrepreneurship. And she, her vision paid off. She was successful in that. Because a few decades later, one of her descendants invited a Parsi gentleman to come to Mayurbhanj and open up Asia's first iron, ore, and steel mine. That Parsi gentleman's name was J.N. Tata. And he went on to found India's largest conglomerate, the Tata Industries. That's a picture of Belgaria from 200 years ago. And that's a picture of Belgaria today, after my parents and family decided to restore it with the same idea, rebrand it to have people from all over the world come here, attract travelers and the best of artists and writers. You see, because in the 20th century, the Belgaria Palace had also been a home for a lot of artists, writers, poets. The Bhanj dynasty's most famous ruler, His Highness Maharaj Sriram Chandra Bhanjdeo, had restored the interiors of Belgaria for his second wife, Maharani Sucharu Devi, the woman in the previous photo. And what they did was something quite beautiful. They decided to make Belgaria from a home, from a property to a platform, to actually invite the best of minds, writers, poets, philosophers, stellar figures from the independence movement, philosophers, to come here and start a confluence of ideas, have the best of the minds meet. You see, the story of Belgaria and Mayubhanj goes hand in hand. The growth of the region and the growth of Belgaria go hand in hand. But I hadn't seen this version of my house. I hadn't seen the golden era of the state, the golden era of Kalinga. What I remember growing up was that the rooms where the conversations of the independence movement or gender equality and feminism and the Bengal Renaissance and the Bohemian era of writers and poets and artists happened and took place were actually filled with bats mostly. And the other rooms were all locked up with layers and layers of dust and trunks and storage. So what I got was fragments of a vision of what it used to be. This is a calendar from 1948, when Bulgaria actually ran as an experiment to be a constitutional democracy. So when India attained freedom in 1947, Mayubhanj actually signed on to the accession of freedom and be part of India in 1949. This is a state calendar. This is what the restoration of the house looked like. So the reason why I also had a certain idea of my hometown, of my state, of my region, was because I mostly heard about it from headlines in newspapers. And the three biggest facts that I heard growing up about Mayurbhanj, I'd like to share with you. The first was that Mayurbhanj was part of the Red Corridor. The Red Corridor was a name given to a region of India which was struck by counterinsurgency, both by the Maoist and Naxalite movement. A little over a decade ago, Mayurbhanj was called one of the poorest districts and most backward in India. And third, Mayurbhanj is part of a state that is frequently hit by natural disasters, exasperated by climate change. This was a headline from the New York Times which described actually a positive story about Orissa. And what I hated was they couldn't even call our, say our name. But all these above are facts. However, while restoring Belgaria and meeting people from the community, taking part in celebrations and festivals, listening about our oral history, about our ancestors, about their, about their you know, seafaring, that we were seafaring voyagers who went to different countries, we were explorers, that we were warriors who fought off invasions for hundreds and hundreds of years, that we had community initiatives like the Ratsya that brought people together. I realized that even though the above were facts, when we allow people to tell their stories and we are able to put them on a platform and give them a platform to be represented in a way that they would like to be known to the world, we actually give them agency to re-script their narrative with respect, humility, and grace. And it made me realize that sometimes the biggest idea and being and having the most innovative idea actually comes from the smallest perspective shift. And that's part of the innovation process, right? I wanted to do big things, be in a big city, have the biggest job. I actually came back and realized that my people had the biggest hearts. So I want to talk about two examples where I felt that the idea of storytelling and narrative building actually had a more tangible impact. Earlier this year, my hometown of Mayurbhanj, two thirds of it was up in flames. The Simlipal UNESCO biosphere and elephant and tiger reserve 
was fast catching on with the forest fire. Orissa this year topped the state with the highest number of forest fires. And what the media largely covered was heart-wrenching stories of how the forest was up in flames, there was a lot of, it had been carrying on for about two weeks before there was actually any action taken on ground, that what was happening with political will, or the lack thereof, to do something about the fires. I want to talk to you about a side of it and that experience that I had. You see, what the media largely uncovered was the number of youth on foot, on bikes, on cars, who actually came to Mayurbanj and to Simlipal and started driving forest fire lines. That's basically when you make bridges between the leaves, the fire doesn't spread. What the media largely uncovered was the number of youth from media stations, um, citizen journalists who came to Belgaria. The number of youth who actually made Belgaria their home for those two and three weeks and sat and made it a 24-7 station to actually um, talk about developments on a live basis on what was happening to inform elected representatives to do something about it. Bulgaria had already, always been a bastion for community initiatives. And I had already seen how my family, generation after generation, came back and out of some, and, and for some reason, with blood, sweat, and tears, would, like a mandala, come and keep restoring the home, every generation adding to it, as it disintegrated, added back to it. And I never understood why. Because they saw that Bilgar used to act as a beacon of hope. It brought people together. That the house was actually a platform rather than a property. And Bilgar had always been a hotbed of community initiatives, and this time was no different. Earlier this year, the Bilgaria path, and what I started realizing that was really important was that there were connecting threads between the stories I had heard passed down in folklore about Mayurbhanj and the connecting threads that I thought could have actually made Bilgaria great today, invited global travelers from all over the world to come back to Mayurbhanj and you know, invest in the people, come and share ideas, make it again a place um, of, of sharing stories. So earlier this year, the Bilgaria Palace took part in a campaign called the Karkhana Chronicles in partnership with the Refashion Hub, a circular, platform, a circular fashion platform. And what they did was they chose palaces, forts, and museums from across India, and they commissioned textile installations to actually be on on-site installations and be covered on their website. Now, there were, there was, there's eminence in doing a project like that and, you know, and, and talking about the arts and culture, but again, I'd like to focus on a part that I noticed that may have been really small, but really impacted me. It was when a mainstream, and what we did was have Lipsa Hembrim, a designer who's from Mayurubhanj, from the indigenous community, with her brand, Galangaban, actually make and recreate the Santal Futa Jala Sari. That's two parts of the, um, of the sort of dressing of, from the Santali tribe. And what was amazing was when a mainstream fashion platform like Vogue actually had the Santali Futa Jala Sari in its indigenous drape actually on its cover page and across its social media. What was great was to actually see so many youth tag their friends, their family members, and tag Vogue, and actually go like, that's my sari. That's, that's where I come from. That's what people in my family wear. And to actually see youth come in and see this on-site live exhibition and installation, and their eyes you know, sort of widen with amazement, because they were like, oh, that's what my grandmother wore. Oh, that's what I saw in the sepia-colored, sepia-toned photographs across my house. What I saw was a narrative shift in what they thought their clothes could stand for. What I realized through that experience was that what we choose to wear, and fashion has always been far from frivolous in India, but rather political. What we choose to wear and adorn ourselves with says a lot about us. What the Belgaria Palace chose to have as an on-site installation, as a piece of art, said a lot about who Belgaria Palace was, who it decided to stand for and stand with. You see, I'm on a mission to make sure that my home of my Yurubhanj is not known by its development indicators and not known by its GDP, but by the stories of its people, by its community. I want, when you come to Bilgaria Palace, you experience my Yurubhanj. You experience the community initiatives, such as the Rath Yatra, now in its 447th year. That's one of my ancestors from the 1910s celebrating the Rath Yatra. And that's my sister, two years ago, celebrating and taking part in the same procession, doing the same traditions. 
And the Rath Yatra is the only event in Bayupada where women are at the helm of a spiritual event. You see, in Mayurbhanj in Bayupada, the Rath Yatra, Subha Goddess Subhadra's chariot, is only pulled by women. When you come to Mayurbhanj, I hope you experience our local hearts, which still practice the barter system and trade. When you come to Mayurbhanj, I hope you experience our, our arts, our culture, our architectural marvels from the 8th and 14th century. I hope you experience the, the indigenous knowledge of over 40 different kinds of tribal communities who still are able to protect and save ancient grains of crops, spices, eating the same things my ancestors ate. These were some of the milestones that Belgaya has been able to achieve. While you all read through this, what I actually wanted to bring up was the over 100 media mentions we were able to garner in the past two years in international, national, and regional news, which spoke about the different aspects of Mayurbhanj, the different stories yet to be uncovered, the different personalities yet to be seen on a global platform. So I can go on and on talking about Mayurbhanj, so I'm blessed to be born in paradise. And I can go on and on talking about why I love the arts, the culture, the greenery, the waterfall, the tribal communities, the, the, the fact that a famous phrase we have is we have 12 months and 13 festivals, about our community traditions, about our traditions which shatter gender norms and shatter stereotypes and labels. But maybe I'll focus on what I recognize, especially for our generation, that we need to find contentment. And instead of chasing, one thing to do is allow the world to surprise you with a bit of grace, open-minded, and curiosity. I hope that when you go on, to, on into this world and you meet people who are from places that you've never heard of and speak languages that you've never heard of, you give them a chance, even if it means that you walk the path less taken. Because you see, innovation and entrepreneurship doesn't just exist in big cities, in fact, in big capitals. And the language of change is not just going to be in English. And the script that the next Steve Jobs codes may be old chicky. And the next designer who debuts in Paris or any other fashion capital and the couture week may be in a textile drape or weave that you haven't heard of yet. I hope that you unlearn all the stereotypes and identities that have been put on you and that you've taken onto yourself and you step back and allow the world to surprise you, allow its stories to surprise you. And you might rediscover a part of yourself that you didn't even know existed.